The Secret Library Podcast is brought to you by the Secret Library Podcast Patreon. You can check it out and join at a variety of levels at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 115. My guest this week is Anne Waldman. Internationally recognized and acclaimed poet Anne Waldman has been an active member of the Outrider Experimental Poetry Community, a culture she has helped create and nurture for over four decades as writer, editor, teacher, performer, magpie scholar, infrastructure curator, and cultural political activist. Her poetry is recognized in the lineage of Whitman and Ginsburg and in the Beat, New York School, and Black Mountain trajectories of New American poetry. She has raised the bar as a feminist, activist, and powerful performer. She's the author of more than 40 books, including her most recent volume of poetry, Trickster Feminism, which we're discussing today. She was one of the founders and directors of the Poetry Project at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, working there for 12 years. And she also co-founded with Allen Ginsberg and Diane De Prima the celebrated Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa University, the first Buddhist-inspired university in the Western Hemisphere in 1974. Waldman divides her time between New York City and Boulder, Colorado. Uh, there's probably another 10 minutes of bio that I could share about Anne Maldman, but I will leave it to you to keep researching, as I am sure you will after you listen to the conversation I had with her. I think that poetry is a topic that deserves much more attention than it gets, and certainly deserves more attention than it has gotten on this show. We've had only a very, very few um, people who've been able to discuss poetry that we've had on the show. And I will admit that as a, as a host, I am often intimidated by bringing poets on the show because I feel uninformed, uneducated, and unarticulate in that topic. Um, so I have a hard time knowing what questions to ask and, and how I can bring the subject to life in a way that is both respectful and um, useful to everyone listening. So I have in the past shied away from poetry, which I think is a mistake. And I'm so glad that Anne put this book out, which is wonderful, and that she is an educator in poetry herself. So speaking to her was as much an education for me as I think it will be for you in how she used poetry to deal with difficult political times, um, facing personal challenges, digesting kind of the world experience. And it really, it really brought the book to life for me even more than it had when I had read it. It's a wonderful volume. It's inspiring. It is concise. It spans lots of different formats and approaches and choices. And there's just so much to enjoy and so much to learn from and so much to be inspired by and challenged by in poetry. And I hope that we will have more poets who are willing um, to come on the show and deal with my ham-handed questions about poetry. But in the meantime, I'm thrilled to give you Anne Waldman. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. I'm delighted to be on your show. (laughs) I was uh, very excited to talk to you, not only because Trickster Feminism is out, but also because we've had as we were just discussing before we started to record, not as many opportunities to talk about poetry on the show as fiction and nonfiction and sort of more prose writing. And so I, I feel like, especially having read your book, that there's such an opportunity for poetry, particularly at the moment, as we're in very turbulent times. And I felt that a theme that ran through trickster feminism was a way to use language to work through some of the things happening in the world right now. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the impetus for this particular collection and how it got started. Well, I think it was, that, as you say, these troubling times and the uh, daily sort of barrage and, um, you know, incredible debasement, as I thought of language. And I was, of course, protesting, as were many, I'm based in New York City, And I, you know, I can't even keep track. I mean, we were down in Washington Square Park often, which is near where I live. We were up around the tower. There were the women's marches. There were things in Harlem and going across the Brooklyn Bridge. And I mean, just endless um, outrage in the streets. And I wanted to uh, also felt as a poet needing, you know, to have some daily way, like a meditation through poetry and these different um, sort of prompts I would, 
a way to getting getting through it, you know, the, with the latest thing. And so um, I sort of thought, usually I take, you know, it's a longer process for a, a book of, you know, this size. And, and also I tend to work on projects that are, want, you know, a poem, a long poem that's a book. I have a thousand page poem on, on patriarchy and feminism that, you know, took probably 20 years all in all to, to co- bring together. And um, my last book with Penguin was the Gossam Murmur, which takes it on archive as this real trope for our time. And what do we want to leave behind to show that we were semi-human and civilized? <laughs> like not all of us were just killing one another and that sort of thing. So I've had these, you know, ambitious sort of big book, big, big, big book long projects that uh, just go on and on. So this was a challenge to come up with um, sort of shorter things that were also useful in uh, protest readings and things that were generated by being out in the street, you know, taking notes and then coming back and embellishing and, and, you know, so it's a range. And because of the feminism in there uh, and trickster, you know, that there's a claim that, that, that not men, there's no sort of tradition of, of female tricksters. So I had to challenge that a bit. And I was wanted to be playful. It was hard <laughs> sometimes. But, um, you know, the idea was some consciousness that's just out interacting with what's going on in the political and public sphere. And I've always felt very strongly about the duty of poets to take take things into public space and sort of enter the space and hold the space and that sort of thing. So there was a whole kind of ethos behind it and also an urgency. And I thought this is, this is what I have to be doing right now. And so it's sort of coalesced uh, over these, this last year and a half. Yeah. I wondered about the starting point writing it because we're in this era of very like, I don't know how to describe them. They're almost like acute political episodes where there's like a thing yes. happening for, it's like a flash for a short period. And so there were names in the book, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, I think I know when she was writing this. And and I'm wondering how you, you figured out a way to, to sort of cut it off because they just keep going. So it's this point of... Well, there was a... Yeah. yeah. Well, there, there's a kind of repetition and, you know, there are particular issues, of course, the climate issue, global warming, et cetera, nuclear, which are you know really top of my list. Planned Parenthood is big, uh, and and you know this current situation with the um, migrants and horrible stuff going on at the borders, which you know although they speak as if it's tapering off, it's you know so much damage has been done. And you know I was uh, there's one text I believe it's the the um, last wing with the stars that mm. sort of kind of a uh, kind of references the business of being over borders. And I spent a little time in Texas and, you know, just thinking on that. So that became a, um, you know, emblematic sort of text that, you know, had to be written. It strangled me with your last of stars, which is a quote from the poet out of the Negritude movement, M.A. Césaire, and it opens, you know, nights, the immigrant. And then, you know, words were this, words were that. I go through this whole listing, and it's a, a double columned poem. And then it, you know, it ends with the, you know, may art never be forbidden, may all escape their tormentors, play with dice, cross into safety, waiting in front of you night again, a bomb in your car. It's a, it's, anyway, it's a kind of amalgam of, of feelings around that that sense of the, dark night on the border. Right. So that was, you know, the, these things, these things, these things are not going away. Obviously. No. And then, but the, you know, the trickster side was trying to play with punning and there's some, I don't know what the line is, something about sessions and these sessions that uh, sort of uh, aren't going to ultimately rule, you know, I'm trying, I'm, I was just trying to constantly sort of challenge in it with a sense of apotropaic, you know, this kind of idea to work against and this medicine against the, uh, you know, the toxicity and the evil. I think the line, the line is something like, come melodious ones, mother of sirens, success not be in sessions of patriarchy's charge, 
shocked from the page into mock crown via tr- triumphalis. It's over. <laughs> so, you know, trying to create these uh, spells, these rituals of, of incantation and um, verbal play against these atrocities. So um, I think it was a way to stay safe, frankly, yeah. to, you know, just you have to sort of protect yourself from this barrage. And, it, you know, this is one of the one of the tactics of fascism where you just, you know, the speed with which you're, you're undoing things and this undoing of all the safety nets and undoing any good thing that Obama had accomplished and so on. You know, this obsessive pathological, well, let's, let's not go into that. Yeah, I know. It's so easy to go down that one. Rant. But, but I, um, yeah. it, you know, it became, and then there were things that, you know, I had to figure out what worked and what was, what could be left out and, you know, I wanted it to have a complexity as well and a sort of thread and echoes throughout the different texts of of something that had come before. I was actually creating my own rituals just going up to the tower on Fifth Avenue, which is such a you know, such an obscenity in our our city. And doing kind of cir- you know, circumnam circumambulating and doing this om con be gone gone, this kind of mantra om con be gone gone. And that sort of comes back a little bit. And then the, you know, the various nods to key feminist figures, um, Judith Butler, of course, and Simone de Beauvoir, sort of taking lines of theirs and mashing them up and doing cut-up work as well. You know, that's often a way to enter the, um, you know, the problematics of, of um Again, a sort of debased language, then, you know, taking something in, in, and also being in touch with this sort of fragmentation of our our world and culture. So there were a lot of different, you know, ploys going on within the text. But I also wanted an array, you know, that things had difference and different kind of um, origins. And then I, you know, the overlay is often just summoning these other female figures and quotes from other poets and uh, help me survive. Yes. And it was it was lovely to read because it was I could hear I didn't think about sort of the specifics of the the women's march or other protests, but I can now see that that's what I was hearing. There was this incredible rhythm in many of them. And I think they would work very well as as chants, which was very satisfying to read. And then there were others that were the structure was so different. So it's it's such a nice variety of ways of approaching and entering the topic. Oh, thank you. Well, there's these little, you know, sort of homage to Marguerite Dura and getting into, a, you know, a pro, more of a prose poem form and style. And then there's the Melpomene, who's the muse of tragedy. <laughs> and that kind of is a, almost a montage. You know, different kinds of um, writing come in there. And that also has the, photographs from the Rocky Flats exhibit. I was part of various panels for this 25-year anniversary of for the activists who helped close down the plutonium plant in Colorado, which is very near our Jack Kerouac School at Naropa University. So uh, in the 70s with Allen Ginsberg and Daniel Ellsberg and others, many, many citizens in this community, we, you know, constant protests at sort of expose also of all the, um, you know, strange doings and uh, irresponsibility of the of the different private companies who are in charge. You know, there's a whole history there, began in the 50s. But, you know, it's gone. Rocky Flats is gone. But the Peace and Justice Center here in, here in Boulder is on still on the case because there are traces of plutonium in the soil. They were bringing in plutonium on trains to the site and then they were being used for the triggers for the nuclear warheads and then would be sent on and you know a huge amount of story and history around that and now i see that trump is bringing back this plutonium pit uh, manufacturing i believe it's a savannah place in south carolina so you know it never goes away and i you know i have to be can't be naive it's they're waiting in the wings to come back with you know, the war machine. I don't know how else to put right. it. So anyway, these kinds of things were going on. So echoes of, of 
also past protest and past um, attention to these things that just you have to stay on your whole lifetime, really, and beyond. Absolutely. So how does, how do you enter a poem, you know, I think I'm trying to think of how to phrase this in a way that makes sense. When the issues are so large, when they're so vast like that, how do you begin to digest it and transform that incredible, you know, multitudes of emotion into something as precise as a poem? Mm, big question. I know. We'll just well, go for I the big one. A, I still think I to say, you know, respond with this big thing too. you know, the famous Shelley poets are the antennae of the race. And when Allen Ginsberg and I were um, founding the, the poetics program here at Naropa, one of our slogans was keep the world safe for poetry. Mm. And the other was, um, you know, poetry can help wake the world up to itself. And I think that's what I have personally experienced as a child. It was poetry that sort of woke me up to things. And I would go to poetry for history or commentary. So it became a, a kind of lifelong connection to this particular genre as a, uh, a source, you know, a source of wisdom and information. But I think I have to add, you know, I start the book with a poem called Trick of Death, and I started, it's kind of a, you know, an homage to a friend who has died. And so I thought I'll start with that. I'll, you know, start with death and and also holding, you know, being attentive to this corpse in a ritual way and putting amulets and things on the body and something over the eyes and doing a kind of, you know, an homage. And so many people have passed in this last year who are, you know, I consider allies in the, in the struggle, other poets and artists and so on. So, you know, that becomes a way in as a ritual, starting with the particular, starting with the personal, with the sort of um, emotional um, dance with, you know, the, the, the particular passing and, and so on and loss and mourning and grieving. And then, you know, and then I, I felt like I had to get into the larger sense of mourning and, um, and then also what to do about it. So I think through the chant, the idea of ritual and, um, you know, this lyric approach. So it's, you know, it's always both, both. You want to be, um, you know, also work with the beautiful sound of, of the language you're, you know, choosing to use, the echoes that are in your head. And again, this apotropaic, which is working against, it's like spells against, medicine against. And so that has to be somehow um, lyrical, you know, beautiful at times, if it can be, I um, mean, as well as, as fierce. So, it's, you know, that's the challenge. So I guess that's the way in. I would say the way in is through a, a sense of poetry as ritual, as um, incantation. And so, you know, things that become um, anaphoric or, you know, repeating and things that come back uh, create a kind of music. And so I go, oh, I find that a way to enter in when things are musical. Yeah, I could feel that in the in the lines, you know, that there's there's a way that poetry makes you consider words in a different way. I think we use words really casually and we can use it more casually in sort of longer pieces. Yeah. I mean, I... No, that, no that's really true. Yes, yes. I think that I it think changes it. slows it. you down. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it slows you down too. And and then, we, you know, at the end of a line, you're wondering where, you know, is there a pause there? Is the breath there? And then... You know, and then there's some a piece that you feel is more urgent and it has a different shape and form. So there's all this attention to these different, you know, ways. There's this famous triad, which is the mellow poeia. And the word poeia, of course, is uh, poet, poetics and poesis. And it actually refers to making rather than, oh, the muse is coming in and descending. I mean, that's happening too. But you're, you're also making things with words. So the mellow poeia would be the, the, the sound, the melody, and so on, the mellow poeia. So that's one area. And then you have the uh, fano poeia, which is the image cast on the mind's eye, you know, the, what images you're conjuring and specifics in that way. And then the uh, logo poeia, which is the 
you know, logo, word, logic, this sort of ideas. And so, you know, I felt dominated in a way by not, not necessarily, you know, these heavy intellectual ideas, but these political ideas, I guess, which can also be heavy. So I guess the prescription for me was turning to poetry to get through, you know, like this for me is my, um, you know, what's, what saves for me, poetry gets me, gets me through a lot. So I'm delighted you felt that, felt the, well, I'm seeing you know, the this, sound and the, this interest and I, I hadn't really thought about it until talking to you and listening to you talk, but it feels like there's been, you know, people read a lot of novels and you often hear people saying, oh, I don't really read short stories. And yet I'm seeing collections of short stories on the rise this year. Like we see Daniel Lazarus collection really doing well and Curtis Sittenfeld coming out with a great short story collection. And I'm like, I think we all feel this need to slow down. And I could see people going even further to poetry because everything is moving so quickly right now. And there's so Mm -hmm. much just getting barraged at us. And to sit and read a poem as a, almost as a ritual act, it feels, Mm -hmm. it feels helpful. Good. Well, that's what, yes, that was my intention. Um, to be helpful. <laughs> and I, you know, I still think there's a way to, um, that we're going to, you know, navigate. I feel, in, you know, just that things are so exposed. And um, I have a, actually, there, there's a piece being developed here just using some of the material, just the sounds from the detention camps. And, and so, you know, that too, you, you have specific things and we're all, listening to the radio, watching various TV reports and, and so on, reading all these different, you know, many, many sources from here and abroad. And actually, I, you know, I travel abroad for my work and read and perform and lecture and so on. And so that um, all the ways that we are, are, uh, are accessing and, you know, you not some one has particular sort of places you go to that you trust more than others and that sort of thing. So that's all, but that became, you know, that was so much a part of, of, that has been part of the dailiness with all this going on. You know, some, as a citizen, you want to be awake. You went, and I find myself, you know, in places where I'm supposed to be some sort of spokesperson for my own country and culture, which is, and I eschew that, but, you know, still you, you feel like you want to be awake and aware out there. Um, so I think that's, that's, that was a way for me also to process, uh, these different realities and kind of come up with some sort of form and shape that I could, that I, I could remain articulate within. So, I mean, I found myself a few years ago in, um, Kerala in India, there for the state department and the, I was in some Muslim schools, colleges where the men and women are separated and the women are so amazing in their very colorful saris, but headscarves and, you know, asking at this point, they were asking questions. And I said, I'm just a poet. I can't answer these things. And there were questions about wearing the headscarf and racial profiling. And, but my favorite was from actually from the male side of the room. Can you tell us, uh, Ms. Waldman, about the agrarian policies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Wow. <laughs> I just found that, you know, and then I thought, okay, I've really got it. I mean, I didn't feel totally prepared. I mean, I was, you know, some of that history like any American school child, but still it was sort of, wow, <laughs> there's real, some attention here. Yeah, I think there's a responsibility that seems to be, put on when you write and publish a book, you know, no matter what, in some ways, yeah, that book true. is about. That's very true. And then people are yeah, like, okay, yeah. you clearly have enough of an opinion to publish, you know, collections of poetry, mm-hmm. and there are political elements in it about your country. So therefore, we now have free reign to ask you about any political thing in your country. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. And then how do you, you know, how do you engage with that responsibility? I mean, I think that's an interesting question as a writer. Absolutely. I was at the Jai was one of the keynote speakers at the Jaipur Festival, which is this few, also in India, um, huge, huge uh, book fair and many, many authors and not, not as many poets as fiction and memoirists and historians and 
so on. But um, I, you know, I felt, and this was right in the middle of, you know, things going on that the election had just happened. And so again, I, but I tried to give a keynote that was, you know, about being um, aware and awake in these times, but also looking into the darkness of our time and trying to see something um, generative there. And um, the Italian philosopher Gaumann talks about these off cells in the brain, these sort of very gener- generative cells that actually when you literally look into, the, say, the dark sky, you know, the starless night, et cetera, and you're, you're seeing, you start seeing through that. So the idea is that um, also by looking at the sky, you're, you're, the light hasn't reached you, the light has already reached you, and so you, you find yourself in this kind of... Um, both both state, you know, things have happened, but they already, ha- but they haven't happened yet. But I think the move is to, you know, look sort of cosmically, and I think that's what poetry can do. You know, you sort of there's a famous Franco O'Hara line uh, where he's talking to the sun, and the sun says to him, "You should look up more often." You know, mm-hmm. he's down in New York City with all these towering buildings, and you know, you need to look up more often. So that sense of popping into a larger frame and thinking about the you know the multiverse and quantum entanglement and this sort of thing to you know to just get a perspective and you know see this kind of insanity going on in this little planet earth and this is a version of how it can be you know this is a this is not how it has to be the way we live and structure our you know our our societies and et cetera. Anyway, it's a life also feeling, you know, a lifelong activist that ha- what what you're saying about the, you know, the speed is so true. I think this is the difference um, for many of us, you know, veterans of the Vietnam protests and and so on. And it's it's um, just keeping keeping up with it. And the damage seems more extreme and being, you know, in this. In our country, which has so much power, um, you feel very, you feel even more responsible. Yes. But anyway, that perspective of of trying to see the bigger picture. So, I mean, that's something I try to uh, invoke when I'm in other in other places. And I was just on a tour in Spain, and it was the day when they were uh, it was change of the guard. They're mm. a new premier who people are happier about he's actually appointing women in his cabinet so excellent you know i can delight i can i can enjoy that with friends in you know in spain and visiting the garcia lorca center in in granada just seeing the power of you know lorca's poetry and he died so young and what he stood for yeah i think that is important is finding moments to celebrate in the midst of things that feel so dark and it is it is it could be a full-time job to keep up with everything going on maybe several (laughs) full-time jobs yes yes well the book helps me it's sort of just having this object that shows you know some kind of consciousness (laughs) i wasn't just i don't know one can have these i was thinking about virginia wolf and her suicide and how you you know you could following all this the, the stories of the children on the border in these detentions. I mean, just you really feel sick. Yeah. Very sick, nauseous and trembling. And, you know, it's very, really, really hard. And I'm happy a lot of people are feeling that. And I think that can turn it around. Yeah, I hope so. I love this image that you've talked about, about looking straight into the dark and how that can expand. I think there's something wonderful about that idea and remembering that, you know, we can step outside of this context or inside of. And I think that, I think that's a a great role for people who maybe don't or are intimidated by poetry or have difficulty kind of thinking to pick it up as a way of like, oh, I'm not going to understand. Or I'm not going to go it on. Well, this collection sure, I assure sure. you has lots of references you can hold on to. But I think there's also a space of, of just looking at language from a different lens and seeing how that can inform you, even if you're not writing poetry, even if you're writing something else. I think that looking into yeah, a larger yeah. space of language is important. Wonderful. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I've done that. That's what I do. I mean, I've done following so many other writers and not just poets, of course, but you know, just the world of imagination 
And in a way, this is the poet Diane de Prima talks about, you know, the war is the war for the imagination. That's what we're fighting for, to imagine a different way of being, a different way of working with our humanity. I love that. I think that's, yeah, because if you can't imagine a different way, if you're shut down to even thinking, oh, this could be different than it is, then there's no impetus to do anything about that. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And then, you know, with poetry, as I was saying, you you, you can have these different forms that become, you know, a rant, um, an invocation, and it, it's sort of um, psychologically, I think, you know, like, you know, thinking of other practices that you might do where you work with language, but that, that there's something just healing in, in um, using your imagination and language and sound at the same time. Yeah, I think it's something I think it's something worth experimenting with because I think a lot of us in our education system we're sort of taught, you know, you have those essays that you write and there's a there's a topic sentence and there's a form mm, and you have to get it yeah. right. right. And I think that there's something about poetry that like ups that ante quite a bit of like, oh, am I going to do it wrong? And I think that reading a poetry, you know, where you're playing with language and you have the the pacing and you're taking from things that you've heard around the world. It's a way to, to sort of metabolize that experience. I, I hope reading that is very hopeful for people that, you know, you could use this to, to transform mm-hmm. these experiences that you're having in a helpful way. Well, there's one piece in the book, Clytemnestra, who's this, you know, murderous, really. Right. A Greek figure, body polis ticks, and there's this sort of, um, pun there on body politic and body polis. Polis is the word actually comes from the word eyes, meaning eyes, and also police, so body polis ticks. And, but it was, came off just watching TV. And, you know, it, it, it has this refrain, for want of this, for, for want of a brain, yet I have without wine succumbed this crazy politic. And then unhooked the little box world, which is like turned off the TV. Mm. Men are stumping their speeches. White bodies in the horror void whose desiccated lips spew oil. And then I can't be media for one of a brain. And I always vote beside the hearth, keep my house alive. For one of a brain stem, the noobs go free. All my arrows with the candidates. And so on. And I thought I was you know, just like talking at the television. <laughs> <laughs> Which is strange, you know. Um, and I have a line at the end about, you know, I'm, I'm talking to my, it's like a political speech, I'm talking to my citizens. So it was just a way to play, you know. And I have, you know, another line the dumb TV awakens, no more promises. In the town hall, you want plurality. I must have been watching one of the town hall, mm. you know, debates. And the whole matricidal chorus pumped up for this, and so on. So, you know, I realize these are things you can just do in your little private world. Yes. <laughs> Not a, you don't even have to go outside. No, they come in. And I think about these television. these phrases that have become sort of powerful mantras. The best example I can think of is, is nevertheless, she persisted, you know, that was yes, <laughs> not yes, said by yes. a woman originally. It was originally meant to keep her down. And, Mm -hmm. and yet it has become this whole, you can turn it around. Yeah. And I even saw a friend, um, got a book for her daughter, which was called She Persisted. And it's already a children's book. It's come out with case studies of all of these women who have stood up for things they believed in and reading it to her, you know, four-year-old at bedtime. And I thought that was a great example of, you know, something that leapt out of the television and everyone said, wait a minute. That is not uh-huh, how we want that uh-huh. phrase to to stop. It it could be something else. Definitely. No, no, that's wonderful. That the language is shows up when you need it. It's appropriate to what needs to be said. Yeah, that's very that's a strong one. I quote there's a quote from Bertolt Brecht, you know, the great playwright and so yeah. on and he was very political and this is from nineteen thirty nine, so this is, you know, the Nazis rising and the war's already started, but he has a line, in the dark times, will there be singing? Yes, mm-hmm. there will be singing about the dark times. Mm. I just love that. And then also you feel, you know, you, you're connected to 
this comes up a lot when I'm speaking publicly, you know, what it, was it worse back then? Is it worse now? And so on. And, and, um, you know, it connects you to a, a time when so many people were suffering and, and we hadn't even entered the war in this country. So that, you know, link, it helps link you up to history and humanity and, and all that. But the, somehow those words linking up with this notion of looking into the darkness, we were just talking about, you know, the, what do you do in the dark time? Okay, you're, you're, there will be singing, but you might have to be singing about the dark time. Right. And that I think that, yeah, the thing that helps is, is to acknowledge what's happening and to go into it. And the idea that looking yeah, into the dark, yeah. you do eventually, the light eventually reaches you. It might not have reached you yet, but you have to look in order to see it. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. The fact that things are exposed and, and you know, wonderful to see so many young girl children at these marches and children out in, you know, some of the climate stuff and the um, the kids who've, you know, undergone all these shootings and that's that seems so uh the march for our lives i've participated in that and in, in new york is so strong and i get i i feel that you know hope there with what they're doing they seem definitely awakened yeah they're not gonna through. they're not gonna stand down which they shouldn't exactly exactly they shouldn't and we need to give them all the support absolutely yeah. i mean i do see I think the the sort of hopeful thought is is that even as all of this horrible stuff is happening, more people are standing up in in numbers. Like, I mean, we could yes. spend a whole hour yes. on the Me Too movement, but I mean, people coming right. out and and talking about things, and it feels like, oh my God, there's all this awfulness. But this has happened over so many years. It's just it's finally being spoken about now. And yes, yes, that. In that, in those moments, I think language is used well, and we're using it to improve things for everyone. Good, good. I love talking to you. It's a, yeah, I I do agree, and I'm just very, you know, trying to keep up that spirit of encouragement. At the um, the Women's March in on January 20th, uh, you know, it was quite large in New York, and then I worked with Penn, um, and we had a a reading in front of the New York Public Library. So it was at the tail end of the march. The march was sort of coming down to, you know, the public library is, and there were so many people. It was fantastic. Mm. Really great. And, um, and look, really there to hear the poetry. It was an array of people. Um, and Carson participated, you know, others, but the point was that it was a, linked to that day, that particular day, and particularly the Women's March and the place where we were, you know, Fifth Avenue and 42nd, right, right, you know, it's very key area. And it felt all these things were coming together. And, and there were, you know, children in that crowd as well, listening to the poets. So that was uh, felt like a, a something that should continue. You know, we do this periodically, have these events on the public library steps. It's not the secret library, but it's the <laughs> public New York library. Yeah, no, that's about as public as it gets. That's the, oh, I love that library so much. Yeah, it's one of the great ones. I love your type name, though. I love secret library. That's Thank you. very special. Well, I think that the secret library is, is what's happening in order to create the public library. Like what's happening in everybody's heads that, that creates the yeah, books that we end up reading. Uh-huh. That's how mm-hmm. I thought of it anyway. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I want to wonderful. thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about trickster feminism and poetry and and persisting and all of these important topics. I think I think everyone will be very inspired and I hope we get some some poems happening out of out of this episode. Wonderful. Yes, I do too. Thank you so much and thank you for the work you're doing and we'll just keep strong. Yes. Strong and, and stay informed and do what we can. But I, I so appreciate just attention to language, a different kind of language, language out of, you know, a different um, passion and a different vision and, and all that. So important. I don't so know where important. we'd be without our books and writing. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.